Welcome to Occult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire at occultofpersonality.net. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. This is episode number 194, featuring an interview with Mark Stavish, author of Egregores, The Occult Entities That Watch Over Human Destiny. The Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to ChamberOfReflection.com, our membership site. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian Theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com On May 1st, 1776, Adam Weishaupt founded the Order of the Bavarian Illuminati. Weishaupt's goal for the Order was to elevate society with the virtues of public education, the ideals of the Enlightenment, and the general liberty of humanity. In short, Weishaupt sought to illuminate the world. Now, over 240 years later, and for the first time in history, the collected works of Adam Weishaupt are being professionally translated into the English language and published in a 24-volume set produced by Malta Minerva Editions. To celebrate the 242nd anniversary of the Order's founding, we are pleased to announce Volume 1, Number 1, of the collected works of Adam Weishaupt will be available for pre-sale at MaltaMinervalEditions.com beginning in May 2018. To learn more, visit them on Facebook and Twitter at username MaltaMinerval or at MaltaMinervalEditions.com. A Cult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by Miskatonic Books, an online store that focuses on the esoteric, occult, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, witchcraft, the Golden Dawn, as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com. Our guest tonight is Mark Stavish, the Director of Studies for the Institute for Hermetic Studies and a lifelong student of esotericism with over 35 years of experience in comparative religion, philosophy, psychology, and mysticism with emphasis on Western spiritual traditions. He has authored more than 26 books, including The Path of Alchemy and Kabbalah for Health and Wellness. Stavish is also the author of the blog Vox Hermes at voxhermes.wordpress.com. One of the most important but little-known concepts of Western occultism is that of the egregore an autonomous psychic entity created by a collective group mind. 
An egregore is sustained by belief, ritual, and sacrifice, and relies upon the devotion of a group of people from a small coven to an entire nation for its existence. An egregore that receives enough sustenance can take on a life of its own, becoming an independent deity with powers its believers can use to further their own spiritual advancement and material desires. Presenting the first book devoted to the study of egregores, Mark Stavish examines the history of egregores from ancient times to present day with detailed and documented examples and explores how they are created, sustained, directed, and destroyed. Stavish's book is a thought-provoking examination of the subject with well-researched historical evidence. It's a long overdue analysis, and if you're interested in Western esotericism, it's a must-read. Stavish's work is interesting and timely, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to discuss it at length with him. Mark Stavish, I want to welcome you to Occult of Personality podcast. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, thank you very much for the invitation. It is great to be here. Um, today, the main topic of our conversation is your book, Egregores, the Occult Entities that Watch Over Human Destiny, published by Inner Traditions. Really thought-provoking book that you put together here, and I appreciate it very much. I'm just curious, before we begin talking about it specifically, what prompted you to write about this subject? Well, several things, and, and often it's the things we we don't think are that critical, but I, it was an idea. And uh, I was having lunch with Jocelyn Godwin uh, in Binghamton, New York, and I just mentioned to him off the cuff, I said, nah, I'm thinking about writing a monograph on egregores because you know, there really is nothing out there. And he just said, well, thank God, because if you don't do it, I'm going to have to. So I went home and took my notes, put them together, say, how are you going to research on it? And uh, then began writing the book. And, uh, you know, like Baby Bear's Porridge, when it was done, it was late. So uh, that is how the book came to be. Excellent. It was wonderful writing, too, by the way, because it's different from other books that I've written. It, you know, for those of you who've written, read some of my other stuff, but, um, this book, and I don't say this lightly, uh, really wrote itself because it's a very conversational tone. I tend to write conversationally, but this really just did come across as a conversation between two people uh, as you read it. So it's, it's really nice to read it. it. It flows very freely. We didn't even have chapter markings with, with the finished manuscript. We kind of had to figure out where to put those in. And, oh, here's a good place for a chapter, and here's a good one, because we just flowed. It's a comfortable read, but it also I made me think, and uh, I had to stop at times and just consider what you were saying and think about it a little bit, which I really liked a lot. I'm glad to hear that because everyone is saying that who's, who's interviewed me. And the, the notion of the egregore, or the egregore, and we want to pronounce it because it is a potato-potato question, nobody gets it right, um, is something that we have all been exposed to. And yet, like uh, the invisible demon that needs to be brought forth during the exorcism to be gotten rid of, we don't have a name for it. And then when someone reads the book, and they have a name. They say, oh, that's it. That's what I was experiencing. That's what I was involved in. And there's a lot of aha moments for folks when they read it. Would you be so kind as to define the term egregore for our listeners who maybe haven't read the book yet, just so they have a better sense of what we're speaking about? It's really very simple. It is a collective entity. And everyone has been familiar with this. Everyone has been exposed to it. And what it does is it functions as a social control mechanism. And that's a phrase that you should really begin to understand. Just think about it. Social control mechanism. So egregores control how we behave in social settings. Those settings tend to be specific. So anytime you get together with your family, in certain ways you may behave. Or when you get together in your lodge or in your circle or in your church, or a political group, or you know, the uh, Parent Teachers Association, they have certain egregores, or group ethos, if you will, a group sense. Now, 
it's important because there's two aspects to an egg group. There is one which is just spontaneous, which whenever a group of people get together and, and kind of there's a leveling factor, or there's those which are consciously and actively created. And the book tends to address those more often, but they both have a function. Now, the difference is in the first kind that we've talked about, which is that kind of general collective unconscious or uh, uh, corporate um, ethos, okay, if you will, corporate culture is a phrase we hear a lot. Whenever you have those things, they kind of happen often spontaneously or give the appearance of it. They're, they take place over time. However, in the traditional sense of an egregore, there's actually a purpose to it. You know, not that they don't have it, they have a purpose, but there's a very specific esoteric purpose in that there are spiritual entities attached to or part of this collective awareness that people on terra firma may not necessarily know of or be aware of. Thank you. I'm curious, in terms of the spiritual entities or when you have an egregore that's connected with, say, a major religion, could you compare or contrast that with the concept of divinity? Um, I believe that there is a bit of hair splitting that goes on, and that's discussed in the book. Mm -hmm. That is, does the egregore of the Franciscans, well, do the Franciscans even have an egregore? And one of the authors of uh, Meditations on the Tarot says, no, they don't, because it works through a human person of St. Francis. Is Christianity an egregore? Because they say no, because it works through the person of Jesus Christ, which is, you know, the second person of the Trinity. I believe that that is very nice theologically, but I don't believe it is accurate. I think that if we look at any group, that we're involved with. We can recognize that there are certain collective patterns of both implicit and explicit thought and behavior. And that therefore there is an egregore present of some kind. Thank you. Now you begin your book um, in the first chapter discussing Tibetan Buddhism. And I'm just wondering if you might speak a bit about why you started the book um, talking about uh, egregores that many of your readers may not be as familiar with. Well, that's just to annoy my, my, my Buddhist convert friends. <laughs> they tend to be wonderfully uppity. So, uh, really, they do. So I wanted to point out to them, that, you know, you guys you just move from one egregore to another, from being a non-practicing Jew or a non-practicing Catholic, you know, hence the term Jubu, and, go, and reject all of the conservatism of that, those religions to go to uh, an equally medieval and conservative religion known as Tibet and Buddhism. And then once the shock wears off and they can breathe again, um, it's the question of what's going on there. And Buddhism has very strong social control mechanisms. And you see it in, particularly in the, convert the convert community, you know, and it's very powerful. Uh, now, again, is this good or ill? Well, that depends on the individual. But it is there. And since most people are familiar with the notion of Alexander David Neal and her discussion of the Hopa and the Tolku and the magical creations and projections, I thought that was a good place to start, both for the traditional occultist but also for people who are familiar with Buddhism. Uh, I think Alexander David Neal gets a bad rap, you know, so do a few others. That, I mean, they were there back back in the day. So it's always, it's always interesting when stuff comes out about Blavatsky, you know, that they find out later was true that, you know, these Western, you know, these scholars had, had dismissed in their, in their snobbishness. So I yeah. feel the same way about her. I thought she was a good stick. Yeah, there's no substitute for being there and doing it yourself. Right, and, and, and you know, she, this thought form uh, is something that is the key to, you know, much of her longevity of her writing. This notion that she has created this thought form, this pulpa. 
And that is the basis of all magic and all occultism everywhere, that the mind can affect energy and that energy can coalesce into matter. And then the question comes in, where does consciousness play a part? And do these things become semi-autonomous or, or self-aware? It's a, an early form of, you know, if you want to call it artificial intelligence, what we're looking at. I mean, most modern cultists, even some of the folks that uh, I've talked to uh, who have written extensively are, are quite naive about the notion of thoughts. Mm, that's interesting. And of, well, and the role of actually understanding their own mind, because they, they tend to limit magic to this thing that they, they can, you know, as if it's only ceremonial or something of that nature. That's fascinating. I mean, if it if it doesn't have the power to transform the mind or to recognize itself, then... And what's going on? Well, and, and we have to ask ourselves, um, if our thoughts are things, or the potential to become a, a corporeal thing of some kind, density, if we're looking at a spectrum here. Uh, just as we are speaking, there is a small graph going across my screen that shows uh, the lines of the conversation. Now, some are bigger than others, some are farther apart. And, you know, our thoughts are like that, too. So how do our thoughts then affect not only perception, which is really the realm of psychology, uh, how do they affect experience in terms of physiology, so we have health, but then how do they affect the physical world around us? And that is an area that I've seen many modern magicians abandon because they have not had the ability to make any change in the physical world. And I believe that the reason for that is because of the amount of mental discipline that's required in terms of self-awareness. Yeah, that's so a good point. When look, well, when you look at the well, when you look at some of the, uh, the Vajrayana, which is really a survival Asiatic uh, shamanism, when you look at magical Taoism, and when you look at a lot of the Indian yogas and tantras, I mean, it all starts with this kind of notion of my thoughts are real. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of areas we can go into here that would be humorous and politically incorrect, uh, but at the same time, that's the fundamental notion. So, if I have a thought, this is the key. All egregores are thought forms, but not all thought forms are egregores. What really argues, I think, or I could make an argument based on what you're saying, that it's crucial to discipline and purify the mind in order that the thoughts don't become harmful to yourself and others. Well, yes. And, and we talked, I talked about that, you know, 10 years ago when I wrote Kabbalah for Health and Wellness and it was kind of just blown over by some people and others thought, wow, what a groundbreaking statement. Because if you look at the contemporary cult community, it doesn't believe that any kind of purification is necessary whatsoever. And then they wonder why so many of them are, are neurotic and physical wrecks. Another and, good point. Uh, yeah, and that's we get into that in the, the book later when we talk about the harmful effects of egregores. Some, some of them were quite uh, physically and psychologically and spiritually tragic. And we give those because they are extreme, and that's the point. They are extreme, but you know, I, I talk to folks who are extensively involved in various forms of demonology and exorcism, and almost all of them come to a terrible end. Very few of them end their lives well. And that needs to be paid attention to, okay, uh, because they fit, they don't have good psychic hygiene. That's an important and, point, yeah. Well, while we're getting off the point a little bit, you know, back to the notion of the egregore, it's since it's a collective entity, then the question is, you know, your mother was right. You know, pick your friends because you become like the company you keep. And historically speaking, you know, there there's some jokes about, you know, uh, a group of yogis should never be more than half a dozen. Uh, you know, magical circles, the old Rose Croy was, the magic number was nine. There are only nine people in each circle. And the, the important point here is that, the important point here is that um, you, you become like the five people you spend the most time with. Right. It's just that simple. And, that's, again, what is that? Is that intentional? With most people, no, it's not intentional because they don't really intentionally pick their friends well. That's right. Now, 
I have people all the time ask me, young guys, you know, say, oh, man, Mark, my life's a disaster, blah, blah, blah. What can I do? I need to, I need to make some money. I need to, you know, change my life. What can I do? And I, I look at them and I said, uh, where do you live? And I said, nah, turn on your computer, go online right now. Okay. I said, what I want you to do is I want you to find the wealthiest area code where you live in your area. You have them? Good. Now what I want you to do is I want you to find the uh, nearest Rotary Club and go join it. Hmm. Okay, I mean, I've got, got two heads. <laughs> I said, well, who's at that club? None of your lodge mates. <laughs> That's right. They're in Bicycle Messenger Lodge number one, Manhattan. Hmm. You know? They said, you have to go be where the people are who have money and know how to make it. That's an excellent point. I'm wondering if we could go back uh, to your discussion of Tibetan Buddhism because you discuss a, a, what they might call a deity but um, is known as Dorje Shugden. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. And, and just to just backtrack a little bit, you know, in, in the discussion that is reported by... Uh, Alexander David Neal, with her, um, with the, the Lama, he says, you know, just because we don't believe in lions, doesn't mean they're not out there. That's right. And we and we have to be careful not only of the lions we create, but the lions created by others. Absolutely. Now, George Shugden is an interesting character because there's a great deal of controversy within Tibetan Buddhism over it. Specifically within the Galukpa sect, most people don't know it, but the Dalai Lama is only the head of the Galukpa order. He is not the head of all Tibetan Buddhism. And there is considerable, even up until before the Chinese invasion, the Galukpa were quite adamant about stomping out other Buddhist sects, particularly the Nyingma. And that meant through violence. That's so, right. Conversion or death. And many people, particularly converts in the West, don't want to know that. And that's a reality. Mm -hmm. So within these different sects, they have protector deities, and these protector deities are made up of usually two kinds of things. One is a, de a being of some kind, usually an earthbound god, which is really similar to a demon, or an elemental, but a demon really that is bound by oath, oath bound to do a certain thing or protect a certain place, and that usually is justified under protecting under the Dharma. Now, another thing is human beings can be brought into this service as well. And Dorje Shugden is a, believed to be uh, a prisoner who was executed and brought to this process of uh, deification. This should not be unfamiliar to some of your uh, listeners who are familiar with some of the darker things. Uh, that is not an unusual statement. Okay. So... The energy, the consciousness can be earthbound, if you will, or bounded in some astral fashion to act as a conduit between the visible and the invisible realms. And George A. Shugden is a protective deity uh, that uh, the Dalai Lama had practiced in his youth. He has since rejected it and urged uh, other uh, Buddhists not to practice it. And one of the reasons is that when they say a protective deity, they mean not only a protector of the Lukapa like, sect, but that means all sects outside the group, but up until really they had to get along when they finally had to play nice after the Chinese invaded. Uh, that meant any enemies of the Dharma, which basically meant everybody else, you know, for, in reality. So, uh, so there you have it. And, and George Shugden is a very controversial figure. But we see the same notion of formation of the beings. I mean, what do we have with Jesus but a crucified or murdered uh, you know, criminal. We have two thieves murdered with him, you know, crucified along with him, that are brought into the egregore for the formation of the spiritual conduit. You know, we see that all throughout uh, various, uh, you know, third world practices, and more primitive practices, and not much more because it's basically the same thing. It, it has to do with the nature of energy consciousness and blood and how, how all these things interact. Which that brings me to an interesting point that you you made in the book 
Um, you talk about these egregores basically attracting sympathetic souls for the purpose of vampirizing them. Sure. What you have is, again, every, everything you hear is energetic. So, like attracts like. That's what you feed upon. I mean, we have dinner. We eat. We excrete. We reproduce. What? Why? Why do we think that these energetic beings don't as well on some level? And you know, when people go to certain stores, they just like it there. They feel good there. You know, they're not going to buy anything, Mom, but they like it. They may go to a certain restaurant, feel the same way. They just want to have a drink, to sit with friends. They like the view. You know, everything is very uplifting. Same thing with other people that they go to or certain clubs or certain events. Okay. Well, the, the reverse is true as well. I mean, if, if you're going at a strip club, I mean, what's going to be there? If you're going to a bar, what do you expect to find? I mean, there's going to be energetic parasites there. And, and, then, there's, and then there's variations along the way, of course. Same thing with neighborhoods. I mean, this blends over into another topic that we often get dragged into, and that's the discussion of, you know, demonology, obsession, possession. But, you know, you really, you know, you know cleanliness really is next to godliness. I mean, there is something to be said for the notion of, you know, feng shui, which is the air and water, the energy of life, okay, and how they move. And, you know, you can get a pretty good idea of what location which houses, which areas in the neighborhood are going to be prone to, uh, we'll say, parasitical problems to be polite just by looking at them. Like attracts like. You brought this up earlier, the idea that major religions essentially are promulgating egregores even though it might be under the guise of divinity or deity which puts religious people in a bit of a bind in terms of freeing themselves from this sort of situation, it would appear. Well, everybody's in the same bind, whether they're religious or not, because, again, uh, I've seen people in this bind with occult groups, with uh, political movements, probably the most damaging and prominent egregore we have right now, the most dangerous one, is political correctness. It's insidious and everywhere. To try and get people to disengage from that. You think for themselves. You see the obvious. So it's no different. The idea yeah. is a conforming mechanism for better or worse. And sometimes it's good. Sometimes these conforming mechanisms are helpful to us. Okay? Such as, you know, you know, learning how to appropriately behave in public. You know, when you see it at a restaurant. Uh, learning how to uh, be polite. Uh, there are certain learning how to sit in class and learn, or how to share. Now, there's a lot of good conforming mechanisms that we have out there, and I don't want that message to be lost because there are helpful and healthy egregores. You know that. Any, I know a lot of people who are involved with the great egregore known as their local gym. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just, oh, man, I got to go to the gym. And then once they get in there, it's like, bam, bam, bam. The juices are flowing. Things are happening. Okay? Uh, we can look at certain aspects of, uh, you know, AANA. You know, helping people pull away from addiction through the power of that group conformity. So... There are good aspects, and I want that to be clear. But often what we see is the most insidious ones uh, tend to be, at some point, something that's gone toxic, regardless of whether it's a religion or political philosophy, which are the two big ones that you run into, religion and political philosophy, the two biggest aggregates. Yeah. Now, when I used to be more a active on Facebook, I would notice that you were rather outspoken in terms of um, political correctness and and trendy uh, social ideas. Um, and I'm just curious if you have any advice for people involved in the occult or esoteric 
who have adopted those ideas or feel some sort of um, what you might call like social or political crusading that they seem to marry with their esoteric beliefs. Oh yeah, that that you're you're on the that that's the path to perdition right there, literally and figuratively, because you know those who can do uh, those who can't become social activists, and and you see that you see that within all religions and metaphysical groups, particularly, you know, in the beginning it's about individual awakening, okay, and it's about method and practice, and when that no longer works, then it's about some kind of group think or group identity okay i am this i am that and there's a certain buzz that comes from being part of the group because of the juices that flow on. and then when that no longer works you know you just kind of degenerate on to some variation of the unitarian universalists and you're just a political action committee under the guise of religion or metaphysics and spirituality and so you know it, it, you can because you only bring to the world what you are now you can't, you can't, you only remake it in your own image. You're not going to make it better. And in fact, the world doesn't really need to be better. The world can't be fixed. Only, only people can change themselves. So this whole notion of politicizing occultism and politicizing these movements and these witch hunts that go on, like in the OTO and other groups that I hear about, uh, these are just an excuse for not actually having done the work themselves and being failures at it. That's really what it is. So if you if you want to be serious about your work, you have to have a daily practice, a good practice. You have to be disengaged from a lot of these uh, threads that pull you in different directions. And you have to get together with a small group of people who don't necessarily think all as you do on all things, but who are dedicated to their practice as well and who need to help in those areas. But, you know, I, there's no such thing as a cosmic politics. And, you know, I, um, got, I, I took Christian Bernard to task for that. You know, every, some of your listeners may know he's the uh, imperator of the Rosicrucian Order, Amor. Mm -hmm. uh, his father, his father was Raymond. And uh, Christian took over maybe in the early 90s. He's been there for about uh, 30 years. And... Um, Last spring, I guess, or in April, May, or something like that, March, I got a copy of an article that he had written called Cosmopolitics. And, and there's no such thing. These are all just human ideas projected onto the universe. The, the universe is only concerned with the hierarchy, and the hierarchy is power. And that power on each level implies a direct information and awareness as well. So it's not blind power, it's intelligent power. So, in t in, so knowledge and gnosis and power are synonymous. They're one and the same on, the, on that level. And if you don't get that, then you don't understand that there's really nothing that you can affect in the physical world uh, of, of any lasting means. But that power is only achieved individually. Now, some people will form groups and attempt to access and attain it, but still the idea is through that egregore, they then achieve some level of that themselves. They get a piece of it, a piece of that cosmic pie, if you will, and that you know, specialized energy, whether it be the or Mercurial, or Marshall, or, or Solar, what have you, concerning something like that. But that's, you know, that's a, a very personal experience, too. So... Any, anything that is talking about universal reformation or change or salvation is a trap. It is an abuse of your goodwill and will only lead you to sorrow and suffering because National Socialism and Communism were both utopian ideas. Do you see? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was saying that is not understood by a lot of people. Those utopian ideals murdered, what, well over 100 million people collectively? At least. Yeah. Do you see, I mean, it seems to me that there's many esoteric 
uh, schools of thought that run along similar utopian lines. I mean, Rosicrucianism is probably the most obvious, but thankfully it's never gone to those extremes. But even there, the Rosicrucianism and the utopianism there is open to serious question. Mm -hmm. I mean, universal reformation in you know 1605 has a whole different meaning than using those words in, in 2018. Uh, so the, the contextual nature of that that people keep bringing up is, is always lost. I'm curious why you think it is that so few people are willing to point out these things. Is it just social pressure or they don't want to bother or maybe most people actually think the opposite is true? Do you have any sense of that? in terms of the political correctness in the occult community? Well, because it takes real effort to, to think about these things and to, to walk around them. It takes different kinds of life experience that you don't often acquire with, with, until time. One of the, the great problems is I mean, we have you know 20-year-olds and 25-year-olds you know, writing books on occultism, 30-year-olds. <laughs> Excuse my, my laughter, but it feels like anybody under the age of 35 doesn't really have enough life experience to be doing much of that. No, they don't. I mean, you traditionally couldn't study Kabbalah until you were 40, and that went near, near dead. And that's because all your obligations are taken care of at that point, and you could free yourself up a little bit to do it. This is um, an important issue. The other thing is we've taken the liminal and pushed it to the mainstream or into the center square, which is inherent. I mean, magic is inherently destabilizing. People don't grasp that. The whole purpose of a magical ritual is to destabilize something so that you can recreate something else. And because if you were happy with the way things were, you wouldn't be doing the ritual. So there'd be nothing to be, you know, you're not going to do a ritual to keep things as they are. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of obvious stuff here that, that gets passed over in the rush for the experience. Um, and a lot of folks just, they, they don't want to upset, um, you know, their, their, uh, their fans. I mean, this is, this is the bloody battle for status as a personality, as a celebrity. That's really what this is all about. And, and don't, don't anyone listening think otherwise. We're constantly, we're constantly doing a dog and pony show to get and hold your attention and then maybe teach you something worthwhile before you flutter off to the next thing. But most of the time it's spent just trying to keep you happy enough so that you'll pay attention and maybe learn what we're trying to teach you so you don't screw up your life even worse. I mean, that's what really goes on in serious teaching these days. But... That's because of the cultural egregore of personality, the, the, the notion of celebrity status. So most of these occult authors, even if they believe otherwise, they're not going to rock the boat because it's not good for sales. And sales aren't that great anyhow. So you, know, you, you don't want to ruin what you got. Well, I appreciate you exposing the dark underbelly of the occult. <laughs> well, I, I offered two years ago. I remember when we talked. Uh, and actually, I had a, a book put together on it, uh, the outline that several publishers looked at, and when they talked about it with me, you know, you know it was, don't want to say no, but no. This isn't good for sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, several years ago, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to hear it or agreed with it or entertained the notion, but now it's in my face and there's no way to ignore it anymore. Well, that's, that's when it, that's when people begin to wake up, you know, and I think that, and that's means that most people are not self-aware enough internally to recognize what's going on. What they need is enough external stimulation to do that for them. I mean, that's what you're talking about, that only when they are bombarded so much by this group think and mind control that they finally take attention to this book egregores. I'm sure if I put this out eight years ago, ten years ago, it would not be getting the attention it's getting now. That's very true, I think. 
it's interesting how circumstances coalesce to to bring these things about and the attention focuses the attention a lot more one thing i was wondering about is uh in the book you you talk about the way the egregore is conveyed um or promoted um that it does it through certain people uh it's not just you write it's not just one person who's being distracted from the search for inner spiritual awakening or tr- or truth no it is everyone who reads or comes into a contact with a book of such banalities and that's what it seems like you're talking about in terms of the teachers and the the authors and the publishers and and what is going on on the internet that's exactly it you know colin wilson who all of your listeners should be familiar with and if they're not they should go read a good two or three dozen of his books uh he wrote a book called the mind parasite and a variation of this was picked up by uh gary lockman in a, in a book that he wrote the title escapes me at the moment but um in the mind parasites which was an interesting book because it's a novel and uh colin wilson was saying how he was talking to the administrator of the lovecraft estate who's also lovecraft's publisher and this is sometime i guess in the 60s early 70s and of course lovecraft had been dead for what 30 years or so but his friend was still alive and he said to him well he didn't think that lovecraft was like great of a novelist and he turned to Wilson and said, well, why don't you write a novel yourself? And Wilson, of course, being wonderfully honest, said, well, you know, he had a point. So I did. Hmm. And one of the novels he wrote was this book called Mind Parasites, which is not a terribly good novel. And he laughs about that. It was not terribly good. But the point is what matters. And this is where Edgar Gore is coming. People think about evil in terms of this great control mechanism, where they have to control you. Well, it's not about controlling you. It's about, as in, you see with political correctness, getting you to control or censor yourself, your own thoughts, your own actions. You get you to do it. That's the best. That's the ultimate. And to right. get you to do that... I don't need to influence everybody. I just need to influence the right person. Well, who's the right person? The right media personality. The person who has access to the greatest amount of minds through whatever medium they use, whether it's written word or broadcast or something. Very true. That then spreads out. And people then get affected through that way. It's no different than any other form of advertising. Except what's insidious here is that, you know, there may be invisible beings on the other side of that that are are benefiting from your energetic uh, outbursts, your energetic, uh, your your emotional, those uncontrollable moments of emotional expression of rage and uh, enthusiasm or fill in the blank, whatever it happens to be that you see the media promote so much. Mm. Yeah, no need for... I'm sorry. I was just going to say no need for tanks in the streets when you've you've got this level of of control. Well, that's it. And, you know, something to think about is that um, back in the 40s, they knew that a single word gets a greater emotional response than a sentence because a single word is uh, it's decontextualized. That is, the person fulfills, fills the context around it themselves. They supply the context. And that's the, you know, the notion of uh, Ericksonian hypnosis. There's a vagueness to it so that the person you know, fills the, the context for, for the suggestion. So if you look at all of the uh, titles on the bestseller list, you'll notice a lot of them are single words. And it was at Woodward's uh, recent book, Fear. Well, think about mm-hmm. that. The title's called Fear. Mm-hmm. It, it immediately creates an endocrine response, even if only subtle. 
Good point. Now, when we take that and we move that into other areas, if you notice, most of the headlines that come up in your news feed are negative. Now, the mind does not know a negative. It creates a positive and then eradicates it very quickly. Okay. Because we have to think of something that isn't supposed to be there, even if it happens very quickly. You know, don't do this. There's that pause of, oh, that, and then pull back. Mm -hmm. So when you see the headlines, you say, you know, things you didn't know. Well, that's like an insult. What do you mean I don't know that? See, there's an, there's a, there's an, uh, an endocrine response to it, an adrenaline rush. It's a challenge. It's a threat. So most of these headlines are geared towards your, you know, fight or flight mechanism. That's right. why people get so. That's why they get so burned out so quickly on on, on on media exposure. Whereas if you were to create a positive line, a positive statement, the effect would be very different. It would be a different hormonal response. It reminds me of those bumper stickers that just say "resist." Yeah, resist what? Exactly. What? Mm -hmm. Now, in the book, you also write about um, extracting yourself or uh, withdrawing from the power of an egregore can cause a backlash. And sometimes it's, it may be better to sort of take refuge in a different egregore temporarily while you do that. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, it's like anything. Uh, you need to do a slow withdrawal because these things are not just ideas. They're an abstraction, but they're ideas that permeate your life. They permeate your nervous system. They permeate your physiology in that regard. Your whole life gets built around them. And I don't know if you've been in occult groups or esoteric groups of any kind that when they fall or when they splinter, schism. Wow, it is, mm -hmm. it is brutal. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff going on in the Catholic Church right now is, uh, you know, an example of that. Because the betrayal of one's goodwill, the betrayal of one's idealism, either real or imagined, is perceived as so dramatic that, again, it's a fight or flight mechanism. And also, if you spend 20 years in the group or 10 years, you have friends. I mean, you, many people have given up things. They've sacrificed for these ideals. This isn't just like, uh, you know, joining, you know, a knitting club. Right. That's why it's like political and religious or spiritual, philosophical are the most damaging and the most prominent in this activity of egregores because they have the most emotional strength on us. Mm -hmm. You know, leaving your uh, civil war reenactment group is probably not going to be that traumatic. You know? You'll miss it. You'll sell your stuff and you'll go on and maybe go visit with your friends, but it's not going to be the same as leaving an esoteric lodge or a church. I mean, I had a fellow at my house today, a uh, technician and, uh, he was telling me uh, about, you know, what had happened to him and his family when they went out with the church and sold everything they had and things didn't work out. I mean, the mm -hmm. betrayal was palpable. And I understood. You know? It's so brutal. It was brutal. You know, I talked to him a bit, even though I could see he was a little confused by some of the artwork on my walls, you know, but still, you know, I want to help this guy because I could use it. It's palpable. So you have to move from one egregore to another, just from one safe house to another, from a shelter to another, and one that's less demanding, but still offers some sense of identity and protection. If you I don't like mm -hmm. the word protection. It's more of a sense of identity. Mm -hmm. Because it's social supports. It's a social control mechanism. So you take those away, the supports are gone, people collapse. So people need social supports when they go through withdrawal of any kind. This is very much like an addiction. It's almost it's identical to it, really. There's probably a, a fair number of people listening who are involved in Freemasonry, and I'm just curious if you might give your impressions of the egregore of Freemasonry. Well, Masonry is benign. 
you know, I mean, people talk about masonry. I said, well, you know, have you been to a lodge lately? Mm hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, if you haven't, <laughs> <laughs> stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> And if you haven't, but think you want to know what's going, you know, go join. There's a lot of nonsense built around Freemasonry. Of course, Freemasonry is not a monolithic structure. It does have benchmark, or, uh, excuse me, landmarks, but no one can agree on how many there are or exactly what they are. But as uh, the one Supreme Court justice said, it's like pornography. It's hard to define, but I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the same thing with regular Freemasonry. You know, the landmarks. It's hard to define, but we know we know them when we see them. And that being that being said, uh, masonry has many variety of activities. Uh, so the collective uh, group think that goes on often shifts from lodge to lodge. The group think that you'll find in a traditional observance lodge or Scottish Rite is going to be a little different than what you're going to see in your average blue lodge. Um, the lodges very much reflect their communities, you know, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if anything, the egregore of uh, uh, Freemasonry as a whole is a positive one because of the intense and immense amount of charitable work that it does. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a member of uh, Masonic Order, uh, you know, through the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, the Great Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, as it was once called, and um, also my son is in the Malay, and I've seen wonderful things happen for the boys in the Malay and for the uh, Rainbow Girls in the mm -hmm. way it helps them to grow and mature and develop skills that you're not going to find in many other youth organizations. So I cannot say, despite all of my uh, complaints and crankiness about uh, certain behaviors and patterns and lodge administration or attitude, I cannot say enough good things about the movement as a whole. I would agree with that. In their, your book, you write also about, uh, uh, at this point in time, a controversial writer, Julius Evola, and the way he discusses the term egregore or egregoroi to indicate a spiritual elite, um, not dissimilar from Illuminati, as you point out, although uh, more as a... Uh, observers and influencer less as influencers maybe um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk about your impressions of Evola and his ideas of spiritual illumination for the elite well spiritual illumination is only for the elite you, you do it in and of and through and for yourself I mean it helps others along the way that's true and, and that's why it's very important to be kind and helpful and generous as best you can but no one gets enlightened for you. If that were the case, then, you know, Jesus died on the cross and we're all saved. We would have gotten enlightenment and we're all enlightened too. There's no collective enlightenment. And that's where this collectivism that we see in the, many of the New Age circles and, and you know, you know, insidiously working its way in through the, uh, the occult orders and groups and uh, various other entities is so dangerous. Yes, someone can help you or they can jumpstart the process, but they can't do it for you. So enlightenment is always a nature of a spiritual elite. And you see that in Buddhism. The story goes, you know, the Buddha got enlightened and he didn't want to teach anybody. He didn't think anybody could understand it. <laughs> you, you might argue that they don't. <laughs> well, the second turning of the wheel, the Dharma, was when well, one of the gods came down and said, oh, please, please teach. And he said, okay, I'll finally teach. But you see throughout those systems, oriental systems, the whole notion that there's times when teachers simply don't teach. True. Because it's cyclic. And what's your impression of the whole, you mentioned the second turning of the Mahayana, the Mahayana concept of the bodhisattva, the one who undertakes the, the path in terms of, you know, trying to aid all sentient beings. Well, you know, on the most on the most basic level, the, the bodhisattva is the embodiment of bodhicitta, and we wonderfully, you know, translate that as compassion. Which for our, you know, Western liberals who just love to flock to this, it's immediate compassion. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I can't tell you how many lamas have said to me that, you know, they have uh, Westerners uh, have very little wisdom. 
And what they mean by that is they just do stupid things. And, and, this, and the way we exercise compassion is stupid. We think we can solve the world's hurt. People hurt for a reason. Part of it is they have to solve it for themselves. Now, I'm, I'm constantly, people constantly ask me for help with various kinds of psychic problems, often very legitimate psychic attacks and obsessions and possessions. I can't tell you how many times people have been with these problems for 10, 15, 20 years before they ask for help. Now, I don't know if you or me, I think I'd be there within a couple of weeks saying, you know, what's going on here? This has got to go away. But they love this stuff and they'll suck it up for a lifetime. And then you still can't get them to stop it because they get there's a there's a payoff there's a payoff from the suffering there's a payoff from the addiction a payoff from the membership. Yeah, so that's true. we have to make that very we have to make that very clear that well, our understanding of the bodhisattva as this infinite being of compassion doesn't necessarily mean they're always nice. No, there's certainly the idea of wrathful compassion for sure. Yeah, there's tough love. Yep. Well, it helps people wake up. Sometimes you need a slap to get woken up in the morning. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've got kids, but I got two of them. You know, getting them up in the morning for school, there's a lot of shaking that goes on. Oh, yeah, like, for come sure. On, come on, come on. Now, I, I stress that because now we go into well, then what is bodhicitta. We call bodhicitta compassion. And, of course, the bodhisattva is the one who's the embodiment of it. But that's on the most outer level. In truth, bodhicitta is the sexual essence. It's the alchemical transformation of the bodily essence, which are male and female. There is no third. There's no twelfth. There's no seventh. Okay, so there is only male and female. Those essences are refined and transformed. And in and through them, the alchemical body or the rainbow or diamond body is created. Yeah, I've been told that um, if the you know, there's a lot of work, like physical work, uh, intentional suffering, as Gurdjieff might put it, that goes into forging the alchemical body because otherwise it can't hold anything. And it just is like uh, trying to put the, uh, the magical essence in a colander and it just runs right out. Yes, I mean, for those who are involved in Kabbalah, you know, really, the so-called initiation of Tifereth, or knowledge and conversation with the guard, Holy Guardian Angel, or you know, whatever you want to call it, it, is just the beginning of being an adult. That just says, hey, you're 18 in the universe, and maybe 21, you know, you reach the age of emancipation in adulthood. But that doesn't mean you, you know, you, uh, you know how to do anything. You know, it's not really until you're an adeptus mind or an adeptus major. You know the forces of Deborah, the forces of Mars, energy in action in the world. Pentagram, energy in action in the world, which is action, which means it's inherently karmic because karma and action the same, and means it's inherently destabilizing. So you only then, when you learn to handle that destabilization, of course. And you only learn that when you fully, when you are a, a adeptus exemptus, okay, or balanced out with the forces of mercy and hesed, that's when you really got your game on. And we have a lot of people who don't understand that. You know, they, there's wonderful experiences of the initiation of the knowledge and conversation, but that's just the beginning. That's like saying, well, you've got your black belt now, you know, for those who study martial arts. I'm interested to see, and I'm, this is not something I th don't think you've addressed in the book specifically, but um, we've talked about Buddhism, Kabbalah, Western esoteric traditions. Um, there's not much discussion online or in popular circles about Gurdjieff and his ideas because it seems like much of what he had to say is in, is kind of congruent with what you're talking about, right? Gur Gurdjieff, I'm, I, you know, I don't know much about him. I do have uh, quite a few books that were given to me, written by one of his students, I guess his chief disciple in, in England, which are quite interesting. Uh, from what I gather, you know, he understood that you know immortality, again, is not a gift. You earn it. You forge something that can withstand the forces of the knot, as the Buddha said. 
you must form an, a sense of self that can withstand the forces of the nothingness, of the oblivion. But that nothingness means of all potentiality. You must form a sense of self that can withstand the energies of all potentiality. That is, you know, and that is the Vajrasattva in, in Buddhism, of the Vajrasattva. And it's, uh, you know, it's a too. But we experience it as Vajrasattva. So the, you, you have to realize that you there's, that's why I said there's no, there's no freebies here. There's help and there's gifts, but you have to do something with them. Like, there's no guarantee that this occult knowledge is going to be around five years from now. That to in and through yourself, that's the key essence of all this of all of this teaching, is that these energies work in and through you. Whether it's a evocation of a demon, you still have to have the energies working in and through you. Invocation of some great angelic purpose, it still works in and through you. Uh, anything else positive thinking, whatever you want to call it, any of these things, part of an egregore. The energies are in and through you. So mm -hmm. you have to make sure that you have purified yourself, meaning got rid of the uh, obscurations, the pollutants, the misguided ideas, the false assumptions, those things which would uh, inhibit or taint the flow of this energy, because the energy brings with it awareness. That's the thing. There's no such thing as just energy. The energy always carries with it a signature of intelligence that directs it. So people have bad experiences often, which we always say, well, that's a good sign. And that, you know, sometimes they get too into it. They like it too much. But there's often when people begin certain experiences because there's the, the purification process. And they're not completely pure, by the way. I mean, it's like when you're, you know, taking a plunger to, uh, you know, to your sink or your toilet. I mean, you know, people, there's a lot of corrosion in there, and all you're moving out is the really big stuff. But you haven't cleaned it out to the, the pipes. You haven't cleaned it out to the walls. Right. That takes a lot of Yeah, that takes time and effort for sure. Yeah. And patience. The bridge you've had it, you, you, you don't get this for free. You have to earn it and make it for yourself. Now, some of the um, the figures you write about in the book um, are somewhat lesser known in occult circles, not by everyone, but by a lot of people, such as Tom Borg and Mauni Sadhu and Paul Sadir and I'm just and Jean Dubuis, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of them and and their work and uh, your impressions of it, because you've You've really delved into it quite a bit. Well, Tom Borg is, of course, the so-called anonymous author of Meditations on the Tarot, which is a book that Antoine Favre referred to as uh, probably one of the single greatest books in Western esotericism. It's often not well known that Favre was a Martinist in his youth, as he said to me. Mm. And uh, uh, he and many others, names all which your uh, member, your listeners would recognize, were present for a ritual I did in uh, Italy. Jupiter ritual, in fact, uh, many years ago, in which I told them there's no observers, only participants. Went quite well. Mm. And with that said, uh, Tom Borg, of course, is writing from the Catholic perspective, uh, very much kind of a medieval Catholic perspective. Which is wonderful. Uh, I do encourage your listeners to read the book and, and to get a hold of it, but it is, again, written from that particular view. Uh, so you have to kind of work with it a little bit if you're uh, not familiar with, uh, you know, the, some of the Catholic theological notions. But the fact that you have a book on Hermeticism, the Catholic Hermeticism is in the tarot, uh, and which is just a phenomenal book. And I think, what was the endorsement on the back? I don't have my copy handy, but it was by uh, a... Uh, one of the most, one of the leading Catholic theologians of the age, too, of the 20th century, when the endorsement mm. for it. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I I couldn't speak highly enough about that book. That's probably one of the the best examples of of real hermetic instruction that I've ever read. 
It is. It's it's a to, it's a complete embodiment of the the Martinist tradition. So without having to go through Martinist initiations with that book, mm -hmm. um, the same thing with Sadhu's book, you know, Muni Sadhu, his book on the tarot is basically a Martinist teachings. But uh, that said, um, then we have uh, Sadir, Paul Sadir, who uh, was a member of the French uh, cult revival. And of course, uh, he was a Martinist, uh, was a Crucian, various groups. And uh, he brought to our, he wrote a book called Initiation, which Gareth Knight translated into English. I think Gareth Knight even said he learned French just to translate the book into English. Hmm. Because Muni Sadhu's version, I understand, and of course I haven't compared them side to side, but I understand that it was not, it was a good translation, but not as good. Possibly because, you know, his native uh, tongue was Polish. Uh, I think it was Polish. And then it was from Polish to, uh, you know, he learned English and he was translated into French. So. But either way, the notion of the egregore is firmly and strongly established in that book because it plays such a prominent role in the French occult circles. Uh, and then, then we have Jean de Guy, who was uh, the founder of the Fosters of Nature, the French-American Alchemical Association, founded around 1978, uh, closed its doors after 22 years in 2000. Uh, its teachings are still available online. It's mineral alchemy, spagyrics, Kabbalah. Kabbalah is a uh, a wonderfully de-baroque uh, version of uh, Golden Dawn rituals, but with a great deal more insight into the potential and possibilities, as well as uh, um, applications for initiation without all the baroque lodge trappings. So they're very good too. They're, those are available online. Uh, Dubuis uh, was in uh, various French groups particularly uh, Martinist and Rosicrucian. He was probably should have been, as we say, the grand master of uh, Amwork in France, but when Bernard, of course, did it. I mentioned his son earlier, Christian Bernard, who later went on to become the imperator. Things would have been very different had uh, I think, uh, we been there. He ran a Martinist heptad or lodge in Paris that had, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, well, I'm hesitant now to say the number I don't have in front of me, but it was quite a large number. I think it was around three or four hundred members. I want that to sink in. I mean, that was huge. And uh, he was quite well respected for his uh, knowledge. But he also insisted on separating from egregores. That was really the first time I had con encountered that notion that one should separate out. This is important to get apart from it. Because until that time, they were always spoken of as a good thing. You, know, you want to connect with this egg you want to be a part of it. You know, it protects you. It's like this astral funnel or this astral, well, it's often more of an astral cocoon. But as he points out, and as so, so do some other authors, when you, when you read carefully, uh, Saidu wrote, wrote extensively about egregores, and of course so did that Tom Burke. That's why they're in the book. And they're all coming from that same French tradition. Um, as you are putting your energy into something, you may be putting in it for one reason, but the leadership may be using it for something else. Mm. Again, it's an abuse of your goodwill. So that's why they're mentioned. Thank you. I'm curious of your opinion on Du Bois' uh, book, The Experience of Eternity. Well, I, I wrote a, uh, I think a jack and blurb for it. I think I did. And uh, his book, Experience of Eternity, is essentially a form of natural talismanic magic for initiatic purposes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had attended several conferences where he gave teachings on it, and I, I actually wrote an early article on it for The Stone, which was the, the journal that they put out at the time. I still have my original notes, and can still remember very clearly and precisely the experience when I had first undertook it. As if it had happened just this morning. Wonderful. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes, if you don't mind, talking about 
freeing oneself from the influence of egregores because that at the tail end of your book you devote some considerable length to that subject because and, and ultimately I think you know to be able to to free oneself you have to understand the egregore which you you know very lucidly uh, describe in in the prior chapters but um, for listeners if you could maybe give them a taste of, of what's involved in freeing oneself from the influence of egregores if they so choose to do that well first of all you have to decide do you want to and you may be uncertain you may like your involvement in the group but you just want to you know reel it back a little bit you don't want it constantly taking up so much time or energy or attention so the first thing you do is, and this can then help you decide if you want to leave completely, it doesn't matter what it is. This applies to any group, whether it's your political group, you know, uh, Society for Creative Anachronism, <laughs> you, know, you know, Boy Scouts, your church, your magical lodge, what have you, is go into your room, your house, your apartment, and everything associated with that group, take it off the walls, Put it in boxes and put it in your closet and leave it there for a month. Just for a month. Better if you can do about 40 days. That would be better. But a month mm -hmm. is good. Now what happens is, as you notice as you do this, there is a literal and figurative space that opens up. Because without those pictures of you and your guru or books or CDs or posters or whatever you have, that even the funky little keychain you might have. Okay? Without that stuff constantly grabbing your attention and constantly reminding you of your association and allegiance, your duty, or whatever, however it's framed, suddenly your, your mind gets a little looser. But it also gets more anxious. Mm. And that anxiety is a good thing because it means that now there is space. Well, nature abhors a vacuum, so you have to be careful and not fill that space in by running back to the egregore to the group, or by filling it in with something else, say equally. Do something different with that space. Or just leave it as it is and appreciate it and enjoy it. And that's the first thing, is get a baseline of just how much pull this particular egregore, and there may be more than one, there may be two or three, has on you. People, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised how... Now, that's why when you look at police states, it's everywhere. The reminder, the symbolism of the egregore is everywhere. And uh, whether it's the picture of the leader, the dear leader... Or whether it's the, the stamp, you know, on the postage stamps or on the letterhead. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I mean, you can't even pick up a, yeah, it, it's almost impossible to pick up a coffee cup, you know, from the National Social Security without seeing an eagle and swastika on it. It's impossible to pick up almost anything from the Soviet Union in that period and not see a hammer and sickle on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's I, I know, I, I mean everything. I mean everything because all of those things are talismans and that's the same thing with people in their groups their swamis their llamas their, their crowleyites whatever they happen to be right they got to have their universal hexagram on everything they do <laughs> it's true because now it's it's no it's an identifier. It's not a means to an end. It's an end in and of itself. That means you're in a cult. Now right. it doesn't doesn't mean you joined a cult. It means you turned it into one for yourself. <laughs> mm. So you're the one who you're the one who closed the prison door. You're the one who can open it. Oh, that's true. Just... These are all good points. Thank you. Um, 
Finally, um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the organization that you run, the Institute of Hermetic Studies, and what your mission is and what you've been doing for so many years. Well, the Institute of Hermetic Studies, uh, we just celebrated, I think, our 20th anniversary in May, and uh, we won courses, seminars, we, we did for many years. Uh, a lot of those were found on YouTube. Someone vandalized our YouTube site, so we have to get things reloaded. That's a shame. And uh, fortunately, almost everything has been transcribed and is available in published form. So the transcriptions are a little better. It's nice to hear the lessons, to hear them. Mm -hmm. That's really wonderful. And some of them are funny. Uh, there, there's some, uh, some of the presentations are actually pretty, pretty funny. So they're worth just catching the first part just to watch that, the introductions. But almost everything has been transcribed. And we cover a lot of areas. Like uh, we have uh, one presentation, which became a uh, monograph, of course, on Obsession, possession, you know, poltergeist, obsession, and possession. We have one called Pathology of the Sublime, which discusses a lot of the things that can go wrong on the spiritual journey, how to recognize them and how to correct them. And as again, this stuff is intentionally destabilized. So if you don't have someone there to help you, a good therapist, a good teacher, a good friend, a good group, uh, you are entering into a problem area when you undertake a cult practice with or any kind of spiritual or psycho-spiritual practice. Because you're trying to recreate, which means, you know, to make an omelet, you got to break some egg. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the egg or the hardness of our personality and our, our sense of self is being restructured through these practices. Remember, the ultimate goal is to create a sense of self that can withstand the pressures of, of eternity, of, of the not. And that's a big order. So... Uh, we, we've done seminars and workshops. Uh, we've published quite a bit as a result of the last four years to get that out there and, and get it stable as best as it can and available to people. We don't have a lot of group work. Occasionally there'll be some things when we come together and do something, some of us, but that is not a mainstay because we do not have an egregore, so to speak, that is connected to anything invisible per se. There's been no intention of creating that. I'm sure, in general, we are part of the Hermetic milieu, if you want. And, you know, the hand of Hermes is probably over our heads in some way. Uh, however, beyond that, there's nothing particular. We don't claim access to the secret chiefs uh, uh, on a regular basis or anything like that. So it's, it's to make information as clear, as precise accessible and usable as possible. That is our, our, our mission. And we have a conference annually in northeastern Pennsylvania, the Express Granton area, and we have world-class speakers who come to it. And then we have uh, people from across the country, and sometimes outside the country, uh, attend as well. Wonderful. Any information they want, of course, I am on Facebook, but the best thing to do is just shoot us an email at info at hermeticinstitute.org or Google Institute for Hermetic Studies. You'll see my picture or some other pictures there on our, on our webpage, and there's an email address that you can send to. But what we really do encourage you to do is to go to, I think it's, uh, you know, uh, our blog Fox Hermes, uh, and to subscribe to that. But if people email me, we'll send them the link and just subscribe, and then you won't miss any announcement. Thank you. And aside from purchasing the books, is there another way people could support the Institute if they wished? Oh, sure. Of course, we're always open to your donations. Uh, uh, that's how we get these things done. We have a lot of very generous, and extremely generous people who will help make these classes available over the years. Those publications that came out of spoken seminars that were part of the audio programs, uh, these are not commercially viable entities by any stretch. Uh, 
uh, and they were only able to uh, come about because of the generous financial support of a uh, patron. So uh, if someone wants to make an annual donation, a weekly donation, a monthly, or just a one-off, uh, they can contact me, and I'll send them a link where they'll be able to do that. Great. That's what they can do. And, of course, you know, buy the books, too, and, and give them to your friends and family. Give them to your lodge library, you know, even your local library. With something like Egregores or some of the others that we have would be very popular and useful to others. That's a good idea. And I'm just wondering if you had any final thoughts for people listening. Um, I know we've talked a lot about your book and, and your thoughts on the subject, but um, if there's anything else that you wish to, to leave people with, by all means. When you undertake the spiritual path, first and foremost, make it about understanding the nature of your own mind. And that's it. And when you go from there, realize that the more you understand yourself, we'll call that you know, self-awareness or self-realization. And with that awareness, you can then act. You can bring it into the world. And that's self-actualization. So that's really what to focus on. Don't be concerned with big utopian visions. Don't be concerned with saving the world or being a celebrity of some, an occult celebrity of some kind or any of that. Just find something in life that you like to do and that you love to do. And through that, know, understand, express yourself and be helpful to others. Because everything that we do is a helping or profession when others need it. Now, some people like to think, oh, you know, I don't like, I hear this all the time from folks who want their horoscopes done because they, they want to change their life. Well, what are you doing? I want to be in a helping profession. So what do you mean? I want to be a nurse, a doctor, a teacher, a social worker? Because we, that's how those are labeled. So you know what a helping profession is to me? It's my mechanic when I need my, you know, something done in my car. Hmm. Helping profession is a plumber when you know you need something done to be a plumber. So remember that that all everything we do has the potential to be helpful to others and a vehicle of our expression, of our knowledge, of ourself, and our relationship to life. Because that's what this is really about. This is about the energies of life. Well, Mark, it's really been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you very much. It's been great to be here. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos, and the outro music is I Watch Over You by Federico Moschiguri. In the Chamber of Reflection, we've begun our study circle around P.D. Ospensky's excellent book, The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution. This wonderful little text contains transcriptions of a few of Alspensky's lectures based on the teachings of G.I. Gurdjieff and contains some marvelous insights into the human condition. Join us to read and discuss a lesser-known book that holds great potential to unlock our understanding of our own minds and how to begin the process of transformation. And I'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, it costs time and money to create. We ask you to support our efforts and the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks. And I salute you. Thanks again for listening. And until next time.